Welcome to the Fact Dev Lounge podcast. Today's guest is the NBMS wellness manager, Megan Sibbett. We're going to talk today about why I hate teaching now and how changing your thoughts from negative thoughts around teaching to positive thoughts might actually make a difference for continuing your role in education here in New Brunswick. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the FactDev faculty podcast for Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. I'm Sarah Gander. I'm a general pediatrician and the host of our podcast today. And I'm coming to you from a remote location because we are still at the time of recording in the COVID-19 pandemic. And as such, my guest today is joining us remotely. And I'm very happy to introduce to you today Megan, who is with the MBMS Wellness Program. And so welcome, Megan. Hi, thank you. (laughs) So I'm so glad that you were able to join us today because I have this urge to have a podcast about how people might have this dirty little secret about teaching. (laughs) And that dirty little secret is, is that maybe they actually don't like it anymore. And so that's why the podcast is going to be a title around something like why I actually hate teaching now. (laughs) (laughs) Do you ever hear about some of these things that people don't like to do when they're calling into your program? Definitely. Yes. Mostly what I hear is sort of the administrative side of things. People like to do the patient care piece, but the administrative side is a little bit, uh, more challenging, let's say. Uh, I get a lot of EMR and at this stage of the game, screen fatigue complaints. Oh, for sure. So I guess I find that myself too, that you just kind of, it seems like a good idea that I get to stay in my pajamas, but then all of a sudden I realize that, yeah, I've just been sitting in the same spot for like eight hours. Yes. Without taking a break to have a snack or get up and move around or get some fresh air or even look out the window. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we had shared a couple of articles and the the articles that we'll talk about today are going to be in the show notes. But one article I really was interested in was the one that we um, shared about sort of this like teaching inertia or avoidance where we get burnout from a lot of the aspects of our job, but that we get this burnout from teaching too, because it just feels like it's just another thing. Yep. It's just one more thing to add to the to-do list. One more thing that needs to be managed. And, you know, there's a lot of already in medicine, I think when you're not teaching, there's still a lot of sort of role conflict and role overload and teaching can definitely add to that. Yeah. It's funny when you're in medicine, of course, patient care takes so much of your bandwidth and like priority. And you're thinking to yourself, Like I even know um, myself when I get overwhelmed with all the roles that I play, Mm -hmm. the best way I can prioritize is to sort of say, okay, I'm going to do all the patient care stuff because that's the most important, but then, you know, do whatever's next, right? Department head stuff or like teaching stuff. But one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was doing some professional coaching for my department head job was... Sarah, the department's like one of your patients now, or maybe like, you know, that course that you're teaching, think of it like a patient. That's a responsibility that you have now. And nothing is like more important or less important necessarily if it's a responsibility that goes towards the kind of what you're meant to be doing. That's right. I think that's a great way to frame it because it helps contain it because teaching, I think like a lot of other roles, could be an endless amount of work. You could be constantly prepping. You could be constantly finding out more information. You could be constantly working to support the students. I think it's one of those rules that if you don't have some boundaries around it, it could take on a life of its own. And so framing it like it's another patient kind of gives it a nice level of priority and also a little bit of containment because that way you can kind of know where it starts and stops as well. You know, I think that when we're thinking about these circumstances, like, oh, I have to teach, or it it sort of feels like another thing, our responsibility for teaching is part of our actual job. I do wish sometimes that it wasn't the afterthought, but I guess it's the nature of the beast because of, you know, patient care taking on such an important role. But then 
you realize that like, oh, I'm teaching a course or I have this responsibility at the university. That's the circumstance and how I think about it is actually how I can feel about it, you know, and changing those to positive thoughts. That was another article that we had kind of looked at about how do I have positive thoughts about teaching? Do you have any tips on how you can kind of focus on that positive instead of the negative? Yes. <laughs> there are many, many ways to do that. Um, in fact, there's so many ways that almost every discipline has sort of taken their own run at this. In parenting, it's called noticing the good. In relationship counseling, it's called positive relationship illusions. Um, in counseling, in my world, it's called strengths-based perspective. In fact, there's an entire branch of psychology called positive psychology uh, that's aimed at increasing people's positive experiences. And a big part of that is how you think about it. Ultimately, our focus and what we choose to focus on has tremendous power in our ability to cope with the world. Particularly, I think, when we're stressed out and overwhelmed. Yeah, some of the papers that we'll include are like talk about how actually physician burnout is lessened if you are involved with students, which was not what I thought I would find. I thought I would find that academic leaders or people who are involved in teaching, again, because they tend to be sort of the people who are the yes people, you know, who do all the things, might have more burnout, but. I found it very reassuring to know that if you're involved with students, that that relationship with your own lifelong learning and um, I guess just the joy that comes from seeing another generation or even like commiserate over like the path that you've had actually might even help to ward off the burnout. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting too. In your experience, what do you think contributes to that sort of I guess, being able to find the joy in teaching. Well, sometimes it's just memory, you know, like the walk down memory lane with this whole like pandemic thing, the Royal College exams all got shifted. And so the students who are preparing for this spring, they actually got shifted. The written exam got shifted to the fall. And uh, for pediatrics, at least, I don't know if this is true for everybody, they no longer have to do their oral exam, which Mm -hmm. frankly is trauma like that would be like whatever I, I can't even say it was getting considered of like because it's it's a big hoop and sort of rite of passage that we all went through. But I think that commiseration or that sort of walk down memory lane brings up some feelings of just yeah, I guess just remembering the good times too and being in the trenches and I get really proud when I go to the graduation ceremony. I feel totally ripped off this year too because there wasn't that graduation ceremony. I love watching them that sense of pride brings you back to that moment of accomplishment and joy that sometimes gets beaten out of you now when you're not, you don't have the same appreciation for the role that you have that we did that day you walked across the stage. So I love, I love that feeling, which is self-serving, but I, (laughs) but I always, but I also love, I remember when DMMB first started and we wanted to, like my instinct was to say, okay, I want to teach every course in sequence that the students have it because then basically I get medical school all over again for free because now I'm a grown up and I might actually pay attention to what I need to know. <laughs> there is that. They do say that you gain mastery while teaching of skills that you maybe only had partial mastery of before because in having to explain it to somebody else, it forces your brain to remember and use the information in a different way. And so there is definitely that added benefit of being able to kind of redo your own medical school experience only with a little bit more, hopefully maturity and experience to back you up this time. Yeah. I hope I'm more mature than I was 20 years ago. <laughs> <Don't we all? laughs> I also think it reminds you what you you do know and what value your experience and your expertise is because for me, well, I think for everyone, I don't know what the like rate of imposter syndrome is, but the sense of always trying to know more, it's never enough. It's never enough because you always want to do as best you possibly can for patients. All of a sudden you get like a fresh med one, med two, and you just realize how far you've come. Yeah. And, uh, and that it, you know, it makes you feel good. It makes you realize that I guess we, I guess we do probably know what we're doing. I think there's just such a huge onslaught of information now. Um, and the rate at which information is coming at physicians and the impact of technology on the practice, I think 
makes it feel like there's just always more to know. And we don't ever or very rarely stop to think about, hey, did I know all this information six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? Through the practice and through the continuing ed and through all of the things that you guys do to stay on top of your clinical practice, how much have you actually accomplished in that time and how much have you learned and grown? And balancing that positive with the negative, which is a really important technique for maintaining a positive mental attitude, is really important to take a minute and stop and think about, okay, so... Maybe I didn't know that piece and had to go and look it up, but how much for the rest of the day and how much with the teaching did I actually recognize that I did know and that I am feeling competent about? That helps us stay a little bit more present in the moment and helps shift our focus from, I think we all tend to be a little bit self-critical anyway and a little bit more hyper-focused on the places where we don't feel adequate or we feel like we made a mistake potentially or we're worried we're missing something or not catching what we need to. And keeping it balanced can help keep it a lot more manageable, I think, and a lot less overwhelming. Uh, it's a bit kinder. Yeah. And, I, you know, we, we didn't talk about this when we were prepping for the podcast, but there was one TED Talk that you shared with me, but it made me think of the very famous Brene Brown TED Talk where she talks about the power of vulnerability and and how sometimes going into those teaching environments, not being like, okay, I need to be the master of this to be able to teach it, but rather, you know, what I can be the master of is the hidden curriculum, even of medicine, which is like being humble, being curious, knowing what you don't know, or admitting that you don't know, and having that vulnerability is such a powerful um, tool to be able to provide our students who, you know, go through the little phase of thinking, you know, all the things and stuff. And I don't know. I remember my mom, when I think I was in third year medicine, and she said to me, her best friend was like the reason why I wanted to do medicine. She's an eMERGE doc in Moncton and she's just uh, amazing. Shout out to Pam Walsh in, in Moncton. But I remember it was third year medicine and I got off the phone with my mom and she was like, oh, Pam told me that it would be around this time. <laughs> what? She's like, yeah, where you think that you know everything all of a sudden just because you've seen your patients. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> You know, it's, I think it's a natural development, but at the same time, you know, you see, you see how much we have to offer students just about living this life and how there are ups and downs and that, you know, your own vulnerability, but also self-care. I know that's a big tip that you like to, that you like to provide, which is like how we can just be kind to ourselves, like you yeah. say. Yeah. So there's sort of two sides to that piece. Uh, self-care is, of course, something that I talk about a lot because it's very important. And I kind of like to break it down in two levels. So the first level would be the preventative self-care. And that's all the stuff that we do to look after ourselves on day to day. And it's usually not complicated stuff. It's, you know, trying to eat nutritious food at a couple of points during the day, trying to drink some water, you know, trying to get a little bit of fresh air and sunlight and a little bit of exercise and doing all those sort of basic things that keep our bodies and minds healthy because that provides a bit of a cushioning and helps kind of promote resiliency over the long term. Gives us that ability to sort of bounce back when something takes us sideways, if it's a cold or if it's an adverse event. When we've got that cushioning because we've been looking after ourselves, it's much easier to bounce back. When we're already struggling and then we have an adverse event, that's when it's harder to bounce back when we're feeling like our resiliency is low. But then we also have kind of the acute care strategies. So when that adverse event does show up, what do you do to look after yourself? Do you find a colleague to chat with? Do you do some research? Do you take a few minutes to listen to a song that helps improve your mood or go for a walk or even just stand up and stretch for a couple of minutes? Take a few deep breaths. There's lots and lots of strategies that you can do. And the strategies are going to be different for everybody and they don't necessarily include, you know, manicures and bubble baths, which I think is what most people think of when when they think of self-care and hey, if that's your thing, go for it. But, you know, doing a little bit of experimentation and focusing on how do I care for myself? Physicians spend a lot of time caring for other people, but how do they care for themselves? And it's just as important to put yourself on that list. If for no other reason than the fact that you can then continue to care for other people. See all that, isn't it? Like the put your own face mask on before you put other, you know, your kids beside you or what have you. I liked what you said about when the adverse or like the negative event comes that you're sort of ready for it and you have a plan because I think that's something in teaching 
too, that um, is a bit of a barrier, you know, like we've all faced this student that was, you know, difficult feedback or there was an uncomfortable situation or like I've had the experience where I've tried to not pass a student and like the stuff that you have to go through to make that happen, it almost doesn't feel worth it. I mean, it's all process that's there to protect everyone involved, but it does sort of seem challenging at times. And, you know, to get through those circumstances, you do really have to manage your mind. And so the TED talk that you sent me that I loved so much. So if the listeners watch it, watch it at, I said in the show notes to watch it at like 0.75 speed, because the guy speaks so fast. I thought I had it on 1.5. <laughs> But he tells the story of him and his sister playing on the bed or whatever. And he, they were doing a war and he was, had all his GI Joes there and she had all her My Little Ponies. And, you know, they were about to kind of have this battle and, and she fell off the buck bed and she fell down on all four of her, like her arms and her legs or whatever. And uh, she was about to cry and carry on because it turns out in the story that she's broken her leg. But he says, for you to fall like that, you can't be human. I think you must be a unicorn. And so then all of a sudden she was like all excited because she thought she was a unicorn. So it's all about how you look at a situation at this point about how adverse or how wonderful it can be. And when I look back on a very negative experience of trying to not pass a student, it was uncomfortable for everyone, obviously. I remember when he called me a couple of years later, because he ended up leaving medical school, um, calling me saying, you know, that was his out, you know, like he was trapped and that was his out and, and it was terrible. But so to see that joy and think about it differently has made it mean something different for me now, yeah. even though it was all very miserable. And I thought, I hate teaching. I'm never teaching again. <laughs> I don't think people get into teaching so that they fail people. I, I mean, I, I don't think that's ever the reason that people go into teaching, at least I hope not. So having to go through those experiences where you're trying to support a student that's really struggling or that actually is not a good fit and shouldn't be there can be very, very uncomfortable because I think most people go to help pass on the knowledge and to help inspire and because they want to give back and they want to be involved with these, you know, little new fledgling doctors that are coming mm -hmm. along <laughs> um, and, you know, could potentially be colleagues at some day, which is kind of neat too. That's a pretty awesome responsibility, actually. Yeah. You know, it's kind of one of those moments, again, where you think about, you remember walking across the stage and that gives you a really, you know, that's a very joyful feeling, I would say, for the majority of physicians. And then you think about, like, we are part of that process for them to have that joy and to get to that place and to, you know, ensure the quality of these people who, you know, like we say, are going to take care of us in the world, I guess. <laughs> Better make sure we take care of them. <laughs> now. Do a good job. Yep. <laughs> make sure they know what they're doing. <laughs> And I think there's all the fun of the networking and the stuff too, and the, and the growing, you know, you've said to me before that we don't grow out of negativity. We, we grow out of thinking positively and how we can look at what it means to us and, and growing with our students. And that's a nice break from clinical medicine sometimes is to just have that time to ourselves. maybe teaching. Okay. Maybe teaching is a form of self-care. I think if you go in with the right mindset, it absolutely could be. You know, if you're going in to find fault and if you're going in to correct mistakes and if you're going in to weed out the sort of weak and vulnerable ones that aren't maybe the good fit, that puts you in a very different headspace than if you're going in to educate and inspire and encourage and to look for skill deficit and figure out ways to help people move forward. Or if you go in with a place of perfectionism and I have to be perfect and I have to know all the things and, oh my God, what if they ask me, you know, the pathophysiology of, you know, I don't know, God help me, the kidneys, right? Like right. I have to go back every time to remind myself exactly how it all works because I don't think about it every day. So I think the positive attitude is it. So if we're not thinking positively, if we're thinking negatively and we're saying to ourselves, I heard that the New Brunswick Medical Society had this awesome wellness program. Can you tell us about your role in that program and what it can do for doctors in New Brunswick? I would be happy to. 
So our program right now is has three main big program offerings, but I do a fair amount of extras like this today and other workshops and educational events and I'm pretty much open to almost any request. And if I can't provide it in-house, I'll find somebody who can for you. So if your concern falls outside of what I'm about to describe, call me anyway, because I'll help work until we can figure out a solution. So our biggest program right now is our counseling program, and it is a full service counseling program. And that means that there are no session limits. There's no limits to the number of times you can contact this program. It's completely confidential. It's completely free of charge. And in addition to being available to your medical students, residents, and doctors practicing and retired or on leave, whatever, it's also available to family members. So if your spouse needs a little bit of support, they can access support through this program. If your kids under the age of 18 need a little bit of support or you want to go to couples counseling or family counseling, that all can happen through this program. So this is a really well-rounded, easy to access. I had no idea about the extra bits. Yeah. <laughs> so are you counseling all of these people yourself? No. I am definitely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It's uh, probably our biggest program. And I think overall we've helped over the last year over 100 different people, um, getting them connected in and getting some support, which is great. So we work with an organization, a local New Brunswick organization called Family Plus Life Solutions. And they sort of have a really wide network of providers across the province. And they work in both official languages. So if you have a preference that you would feel more comfortable in, we can make that happen. And it also doesn't have to be in your community of choice. I mean, it's a lot easier right now because everybody's working remotely. You can kind of connect with anyone across the province. But when we go back to being able to see people face to face, if you are from a really rural community that's very small and only has one or two counselors in it, and that, that feels a little bit too exposed, then we'll find you somebody in a nearby community where it doesn't feel quite as exposed. So there's lots of flexibility in this program. And so far it's working quite well. Oh, that sounds amazing. I, I did want to ask about what happens if you don't want to kind of talk about your stuff and things in your community. Although I do support the power of that vulnerability and I guess trust that people will um, act responsibly, but still there's a discomfort for sure. I think that we have great strides to make still in terms of people feeling comfortable asking for help when they're struggling particularly really accomplished professional people. I think it's harder when you've accomplished a lot to admit that this is one piece that you haven't quite managed yet. However, at this stage of the game, I'd much rather just get people connected in with the supports and worry about the role modeling later down the road. <laughs> I know you do some peer to peer support too, do you? Cause that's sometimes something that, especially like when you take on new roles, whether it's teaching or administration or leadership, that sometimes you need to have somebody who's walked in those shoes a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think medicine is a pretty unique work environment and sometimes it is so incredibly helpful to talk to another physician. And so we have a roster of trained volunteers who have stood up to say, I've had a little bit of life experience in a particular way and I feel like I've managed it and I feel like I have something to offer other people. And so it's a great service that they're providing. And I have to say they're a pretty amazing group of individuals. That's a totally subjective opinion, of course. But they are. <laughs> but they're pretty incredible. And I'm very grateful for all of the service that they provide. And we're actually always looking for volunteers. So if anybody who's listening would be interested, please contact me. We sort of are in taking people always and we'll get you trained and we'll get you sorted and help you feel comfortable in the role it's not uh, not too onerous and then if you're interested in being connected with somebody also contact me and we can chat about that and what that looks like and get you connected up with one of our really amazing volunteers and then the last thing is the family doctor piece isn't it or primary care provider that's correct yes so we provide a service to match med students residents physicians with a primary care provider. We have a, a list of, again, wonderful volunteers who have stepped up across the province to say, yes, I'd be willing to take on physicians as patients. And in fact, they're so good that I often can make a match within, I don't know, two or three hours of sending out the initial emails. They get back to me really quickly. They're incredible. And so if you need a family physician or a primary care provider, please let me know. This one, unfortunately, is not available to family members, just for the physician themselves. 
That sounds important for like students who are here for a long period of time too, but the school actually, I think through their student services also has some access as well and some support. Yes, they do. Yeah. So Megan, one of my like motivations to have you on was because, you know, I've heard so much about this wonderful program with the MBMS and I'm so glad that they have really taken this on as a responsibility and like, an, I don't know, obligation is not the right word, but like a priority for us in New Brunswick. And then I, you know, I'm a very practical person. So I'm like, okay, it's the middle of the night or it's after work and you're just like enough. What does that look like for people? Like, do you just throw you off an email and you're at our beck and call or like what can people expect and what's realistic? So I will, if you give me a call and leave a message or send me an email, I'll get back to you within 24 hours. My schedule is wildly varied and I do work some evenings and some weekends and some early mornings, just depending on what the need is. So it's hard to say day to day what exactly is going to look like, but that's part of what I love about it. So do send me an email, do leave me a message. You can text me if you want to at the same phone number and I'll get back to you within 24 hours, if not earlier. Ooh, the texting option is yeah, good. Yeah, people is. like that. Uh, people are more brave, I think, when they um, <laughs> can throw off a text. They don't have to use their voice or their hospital email or whatever it is. Not even a little bit. Yep. You, you can send me a text. You can leave me a voicemail. You can send me an email. You can look for more information on the website. There's lots of ways of connecting. To close the podcast, I think for me, the moments of negative thinking about the obligations that we have in this life can be changed so drastically by just changing our thinking into positive thoughts, which sounds a little blue, but like, just try it. And it plays right out for you a lot of the time. It takes a bit of practice, I suppose. And when that practice isn't working or if you're feeling overwhelmed, we're really lucky to have something like the MBMS program to really um, be something to work with and that is physician based and 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 really knows what we're what we're up against. So Thank you for all that you do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for coming on the podcast today. I knew that uh, we have had a wellness podcast in the past. So for those listeners, if you haven't listened to that one, that's with um, Dr. Wendy Stewart. And everybody loves listening to Wendy. But, but today, I think we just wanted to follow that up on something a little bit more specific. So thank you, Megan, very much for coming on the podcast today. And we wish you well. And yeah, we'll just close that off for the day and for the podcast. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks.